Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all to the LSC Complexity Seminar. Um, let me outline the day for today. They're going. To, uh, we have. We're very, very um, lucky actually this morning. We have two um, uh, cases that will be discussed, which have been part of the work we have been doing here at the LSC as part of the um, ICOS project. ICOS stands for Integration of Complex Social Systems. A lot of you have been asking, how do you actually apply complexity theory in practice? This is going to be <coughs> part of that answer. So this morning, we will start um, with, Rolls -Roy with the work we did with Rolls-Royce Marine. After the coffee break, um, then Caroline Corrigan will talk to us about the modernization agency with her colleague Yasir uh, Samir, who will uh, demonstrate one of the tools that we use. After lunch, and lunch by the way we will have in the senior dining room, after lunch I will describe the whole um, methodology, all the tools and methods that we've used, because not, we, ha we don't use all of them with, with, uh, in each particular um, case. And then uh, my colleague Kate Hopkinson will talk about uh, the landscape of the mind. So references this morning, and there will be a lot of references this morning about the landscape of the mind, uh, rest assured that Kate will tell you some of those findings, but also there will be a whole seminar on the 16th of July, where Kate will concentrate on the landscape of, um, of the mind. So that's the, 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 the schedule for today. At the end of the day, um, we do have a whole hour in plenary. So we can actually discuss some of your, your issues and also talk about issues with all the speakers at the same time. Um, I think it's important, however, during the day that we do keep as much uh, discussion going as possible. So don't just keep it to question and answer. Um, be you know a, a, a far more active so that we can actually get as much as possible out of it. Um, Terry Stock. Terry um, is the um, vice president of human resources at Rolls Royce Marine. Terry was the one who had the grand vision where he saw the actual <laughs> possibilities <laughs> of what. Um, the, you know, the project who I could actually do and help um, Rolls-Royce Marine. He will give you the background of um, what we did. And then um, Les Kuczynski. Um, Les was the project manager in that particular um, project. And frankly, if it, it was Les who made it possible for us to do the incredible work that we did with them. Um, Les today is vice president customer business in Rolls-Royce Defence Aerospace. So he has moved um, from Marine to Defence Aerospace. So, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, got a warm day in prospect, I suspect. I've been in this room before on a hot, sunny day, and uh, it tends to get pretty unpleasant. Um, you should, with any luck, still be awake at about 11 o'clock. Uh, but I, <laughs> and then I'll put them to sleep. I don't fancy I don't fancy your chances <laughs> later in the day. Frankly, just to paraphrase what uh, what Eve said, she described me as the grand visionary. She didn't quite say that, but that's the way I'm going to describe it to my mother anyway. Um, if I'm the grand visionary, Les actually did all the work, and that, that's kind of the relationship that we've had on this this project. So um, that's what I'm going to talk about: dealing in complexity, uh, dealing with complexity in Rolls Royce Marine. That's me. And that's Les. There'll be a spelling test later on Les's name. Um, what's the score on Scrabble for your name? It's pretty high. It's all about 3,000. About 3,000. always have to check it uh, three or four times. Spell check never works on that one. Okay. Now, I think that we've got... Uh, do you want me to finish at 11 with the discussion, or do you want... Are you going to run 10 minutes late because we're a little late starting? What, what sort of works? We'll finish, yes. A little, a little bit later, later yes, okay, so that okay. you have your full hour. Okay, well, I, either way, I'm going to go through this fairly rapidly because we want to have an opportunity for a bit of interaction with you. So this is what uh, we were planning to talk about here. Um, first of all, a brief introduction. I've tested this earlier. Is it, it is showing. It's working on the wall. Is it showing? It is, mm. yes. Oh, yes, just about, yeah. Brief introduction to a project that we conducted with the London School of Economics. Um, concentrating uh, largely on the difference that it's made and the outcomes of that project. We've got to give you a little bit of context on Rolls-Royce Marine or you can't understand what we're talking about 
I fancy. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the process, the tools and the methods, but as Eva said, we'll do more of that a little bit later in the day as well. So, reasonably fast and furious. Um, cutting to the chase, really, um, we have now got um, more than, um, it used to say 12 work streams up there, but it's actually more than 12, because they've all kind of subdivided and merged into the general ether of the organisation, or the fabric of the organisation. We've got a whole bunch of work streams now being implemented in Rolls-Royce Marine as a result of the project that we conducted with uh, London School of Economics. And uh, what the LSE Complexity Group brought to us were these things here, some academic rigour, some methodology and tools and techniques. They brought to us complexity thinking, which was helpful in shaping the approach that we took, and uh, it resulted in a change of emphasis within our organisation. Less of a focus on reorganisation and changing the structure, a much more emphasis on informal networks and relationships and lateral processes across the organisation. So, you know, faced with an issue, organisations tend very often just to move the building blocks around. Um, we, we, are, we have resisted that temptation and we've worked much more at building the interfaces and the relationships across the organisation. There's still scope, of course, to optimise your, your structure, uh, but we're not seeing that as the sort of primary way of addressing the issues. So a little bit of context on the business, and I'll just bring all of these up. <clears throat> Just to give you a, a feel for the scope of the business, we, we are quite, quite large. Um, some measures of largeness here, a billion pound turnover. Um, it's closer to 7,000 employees now, actually. Uh, 2,000 customers, and we have equipment on about 20,000 vessels, probably significantly more than that now since this slide was last updated. Um, we have some world-class competencies, some world-class people, some world-class experts, and some good processes and tools. And we've got leadership in a number of our chosen markets, uh, including the cruise, fast vessel, offshore, and naval markets. We serve about 60 navies of the world, um, putting various products into those navies. Um, and a lot of our stuff goes into cruise liners, you know, the big P&O kind of stuff. Um, and tugs and work boats is at the other end of the spectrum, at the less glamorous end. We're very international, uh, with most of our manufacturing in these areas. I hope you can read this at the back, can you? so I don't have to read everything out, okay? Um, we have some emerging manufacturing sites. We're in places like Poland and Korea, and we're just building in China. And uh, we have sales and service offices in about 35 countries, so I think we can claim to be quite international. Uh, but it hasn't always been that way. Uh, the original business was this. I'm gonna put that down, because it's not quite working for me. Um, the original part of the business was a naval business in Rolls-Royce, and it had um, essentially two product offerings. One was gas turbine engines, uh, the other was a uh, nuclear steam raising plant, you know, the core, the nuclear core for nuclear submarines, just for the UK fleet, of course. Uh, we tend not to sell those to the competition um, for obvious reasons. Now, that was the situation before November 1999, um, and that's the traditional Rolls-Royce piece. Then in November 1999, we made an acquisition of the Vickers Allstein uh, group, which brought to us capability and opened up routes to market in commercial marine, um, and that's the cruise lines, the tugs and work boats and so forth that I was talking about, okay? And now the, the business is roughly 50-50 split between naval and commercial in terms of revenues, people, and profit, actually. It's pretty much a 50-50 split. So we moved from being a traditional sort of, you know, largely British-based naval business with a couple of products to being something else very quickly in November 1999, which was about a year before I joined, actually. And that acquisition brought with it a major change um, and complexity and a lot of issues. Um, it brought with it about 2,000 customers. Now, I mentioned that we served about 60 navies. So, you know, immediately there you've got a quantum leap in terms of the numbers of customers that you're dealing with. It brought hundreds of products. It wasn't just gas turbines and nuclear steam raising plant. We had deck machinery, water jets, propul uh, propulsors like propellers, uh, shaft lines, all manner of of the cable handling equipment and some electrical capability. So lots of products, faster lead times in naval markets, you're often looking five, 10, 15 you know, years beyond. You've got a um, good sight of your, of your project, whereas in commercial markets, they want it yesterday. Different quality standards, that should probably say, or different customer requirements. They still want quality, but it's different requirements that the customers have. For example, you don't need to have a cruise liner uh, resistant to, to, to shock in the same way that a naval vessel needs to be. Um, they tend not to get blown up. Um, although in this modern world, you know, maybe that will become a requirement someday. God help us. 
Uh, it's a very international business. I mentioned the naval bit was principally UK with a bit of US actually, but uh, the acquisition made us very international. Brought lots of different national, national cultures as well. Lots of Norwegians, especially. Swedes, Finns, Koreans, all sorts. Uh, anybody here from Norway, Sweden, Finland? Ah, oh dear. Sweden? Yeah, yeah you can tell, you see. <laughs> <laughs> They're so different. <laughs> and uh, it also brought, uh, brought with it a privately owned culture. The, the, um, the bulk of the business that we acquired um, had been a family business since about the 1920s. And of course, a family business operates differently to a British PLC. You know, you can, you can tolerate high stock levels um, as long as you're getting enough money out of the business at a sort of personal level. But when you become a PLC, it's all different. You know, shareholders have different requirements. Um, and there was a general nervousness of Rolls-Royce, um, a lack of trust, and that all related to history. Some of the people joining us in this acquisition had been acquired, I think, three, maybe four times in the previous couple of years. There had been a series of acquisitions of some parts of the business. And a number of parts of the business that we were acquiring had previously been competing against each other prior to one or, one or more of those acquisitions taking place. Um, and at the time that we made the acquisition, and for some time after, they continued to compete. So we had parts of our organisation you know, seeking to sell uh, certain products and competing against other parts of our organisation, which is clearly not good news. So that's what the acquisition brought to us. That just gives you a map to demonstrate that we're quite widespread, but you know, quite, quite a lot of focus up here. What is it, about 3,000 in the UK, 2,000 in Norway, four or 500 in Sweden, slightly less in Finland, quite significant in the US, and then a scattering, and this has probably increased a little bit out in the, the Asia-Pacific region since I did this, although the overall numbers have come down slightly. So we're seeing a bit of a shift, actually, from this part of the world out east, which is uh, consistent with I think what a, lot of it, what a lot of industries are seeing. So where was the complexity? Well, I think it relates to what I've just said. You know, we, we, we have now, we inherited and we have now lots of products in lots of places. We actually have quite a complex organisation, um, which I haven't sought to demonstrate to you in the interest of time. But, you know, take my word for it, we do. We have a matrix at the top level and then it gets all sort of muddly and hybridy further down. That's really quite complex. And that's a product, again, partly of history. Uh, we've got fairly complex relationships because of the different national boundaries um, that we've got, the different business boundaries, the entrepreneurial nature of some of the businesses versus the traditional uh, sort of Ministry of Defence oriented um, uh, nature of some of the other businesses. So a lot of that relates to history. And again, I think I've touched on the different national and business cultures. So quite a lot of complexity bouncing around in there. Um, this all came to a head really about... I suppose it was about, uh, what was it, 15 months after I joined, when we ran a conference in, um, in Macclesfield, and uh, I don't know why I mentioned it was Macclesfield, but really, but just to illustrate, I suppose, that we're cost conscious or something. Um, you can't go anywhere cheaper than Macclesfield, I think, for mm -hmm. conferences. And uh, we identified some key issues, and there are some fairly hard-nosed, you know, these aren't pink, soft, fluffy, human resource-y type of issues, improving delivery performance and improving products, but the number one issue that needed to be resolved, said our, uh, what was it, 70 uh, most senior executives, was this one, clarifying roles and responsibilities, that was the number one, and we all voted on these, you know, so we had great clarity about this, that was the number one issue, and uh, the question is, what did they mean? Um, well, the answer is that they meant lots of different things, whoever you spoke to had a slightly different spin on it, a slightly different perspective. Uh, but they were saying things like this, well it's very simple at the top of the organisation, but then it very quickly gets very confusing lower down. Yes, we need to be integrated to give the customer what the customer wants, but at the same time we need licence to operate locally. So there's this sort of clash coming in there, some friction. Um, there's a matrix issue. Um, people hated the matrix structure that we had uh, put into the company, and we had these things called CFBUs and OBUs, that's customer facing business units, they're the ones fronting up to the customer. And then we had operational business units that were, in, in simple terms, making things that were being supplied through the customer facing bits to the customer. And then we had the functions, you know, human resources, purchasing, engineering and all that lot as well on there. Everybody seemed to have three bosses because of this kind of matrix structure. 
And in summary, you know, it came out, well, we just don't know how this organisation is supposed to work. It's all too complicated. We, we don't understand it. So that's kind of what they meant. Uh, but they all had a different perspective. Now, we, we scratched our heads for, what was it, several months, really, because that was May, was the conference, and then we kicked off a project in September. And the reason that we scratched our heads for months was that we just didn't know how to get hold of this. You know, how can we deal with this, with this issue? Because it is complex. They're all saying slightly different things. Uh, so so what, you know, what are the issues that we really need to deal with and, and how do we deal with them? And we came up with the idea of having a, a project to look at this whole subject and to do, I think, three things, which was firstly to identify uh, what the issues were, to really understand what people were saying and then come up with an action plan to make it better. Okay, so in simple terms, that's what the project was trying to do, to identify and understand what these issues really were and then come up with an action plan to make it better. And at this point, I hand over to my colleague here, Les. Thanks, Terry. So picking up from, uh, from what Terry said, um, I got involved at, at this point in time and really developed a project plan as to how we were gonna uh, go through this. We wanted to make sure that it was a um, pretty short time span. And um, when I first started talking with Eve, she said that it was impossible to uh, to make any progress in six months, but we really did. Um, and it was very helpful that uh, we got in some internal resource. Uh, we ended up with uh, three internal teams, uh, people from the High Flyers uh, programme that we run internally. And they were people that um, were in the marine business and also in other parts of our business. So they may have been uh, on the defence aer aerospace side, the civil aerospace side. But it gave us a good opportunity to get lots of people involved, um, plus the LSE team. And we had 21 researchers uh, in the end doing all of the work. Um, this is quite a busy chart, but it, it basically gives you an idea of the process uh, that, uh, that I followed. On the handouts that you've got, I noticed the arrows are missing, so you might need to add on the arrows, uh, sort of, you know, dot to dot type thing. But Starting here on the, uh, the top left-hand corner, um, the key element was obviously to collect some data. Um, the main tool that we used was the, uh, the interview process, and I'll talk about that um, uh, in a moment. Kate uh, will talk about the landscape of the mind uh, tool that we used. We'd also got some information, um, Terry mentioned the conference that we did in 2002, um, we've done some sort of um, cultural awareness type work where people filled out questionnaires. So we've got some information there which, which we also use. Um, two other tools um, that we looked at using was the agent-based modelling and NetMap. Um, and there was some prelim work done on that. We had some inf limited information on that. Um, but we didn't really follow through with that. Um, the other tool uh, that uh, was offered by the LSE was a visualisation. Uh, and again, I don't think much was done on the uh, visualisation tool. So we sat down and we interviewed um, uh, 44 of the 70 um, senior executives that Terry mentioned. We started to collect the information. We then identified the themes and tensions uh, that were drawn out of those interviews. Um, we looked at the areas in the business where there were dilemmas um, and we came up with a, a set of underlying assumptions uh, that, that were really sort of evident in the business. They were at the back of people's minds every time they were doing work or, or they were talking. Um, we then evaluated the issues in context of, of the main priority um, item which was the, the roles and responsibilities. So we, we saved the issues that, weren't, that we didn't think were relevant to that particular issue uh, and only moved forward on those that we thought were relevant to the roles and responsibilities. We then did some prioritisation work and looked at generating some options, um, really then to come down to a set of recommendations that we felt we could take forward to the sponsors. Um, at this point in time, we, we looked at co-creating with a, a small group of individuals and obviously brought into, into that our thinking there, the complexity theory. Um, 
We then went through a plan, we confirmed the understanding, did some, uh, some reflecting back workshops, and then took that through to uh, the Marine Executive um, to come up with, if you like, a, a proposal of, of what should be done. Um, it's a very linear process, I can assure you it went all over the place at the time, and we were doing all sorts of things, but it, it was useful to have a route map as to how we thought we were going to get through. Um, to help us through the complexity of all the, the issues that were hitting us. I talked about the interviews. Um, we did 44 interviews. And we, we carefully selected a set of open questions that would try and help uh, the, the interviewees um, sort of structure their answers and, and give us the sort of information that we were looking for. There was some which was market related, some which was organisation related, uh, and some, you know, basics about communication and, and personal things about success and failure. Um, and the key thing there was to decode what was being said to us. Um, we found that, that after the first few minutes, people were quite happy and open, and especially when they were being interviewed by people that weren't in their part of the business. So they were quite happy to share the information. Um, but we did need to, to decode and identify the themes and tensions. Uh, and then in the two-day workshop, we really drew, drew out of that what the underlying assumptions were. So we were quite surprised as to the number of different themes that were identified from these 44 interviews. Uh, we got over 100. And in the workshop, we because 100 was far too many to grapple with, we, we ended up uh, summarising them into eight overarching themes. So we came with, with an overarching theme and then clustered uh, those 100 um, into which ones they, uh, they fitted neatly into. And you can see there the, the eight, uh, eight clusters that we had. The interesting thing was the underlying assumptions of, that, um, that people were making. So you know, these are the widely held beliefs in the organisation. Now, some of these were actually said to us, but some of them we actually, you know, sort of through analysis of, of what people were saying, we derived them um, using the triangulation with the other information, the other tools that we got. You know, we were pretty sure that, that these were, were correct. Um, you know, things like, um, you know, there's a hidden agenda, you know, came out. Um, sometimes people actually made that statement. Um, <coughs> sometimes, you know, someone should make it clear for me is something that, not, I, I don't think anyone actually said that, but, you know, it was, it was point, all the things that were said were pointing at that, that people wanted, um, you know, somebody to tell them exactly, you know, how it was and, and what they should do. So, following all of that research and analysis, we then um, reached a point where we have got four broad areas that we were looking to address uh, to move into some kind of implementation phase. Um, again, headed up into, into groups, you know, the customer market interface, uh, working the organisation, uh, the leadership and the management uh, process that we were adopting in the business, and then, you know, the strategy, the structure, and, and where the synergy was in the business. And Terry is going to take you through these, I think, through okay. some of the outcomes on that. Thank you. Okay, so these were the four broad areas, um, and right at the outset, when I said that I was cutting to the chase, I talked about work streams, and the, the work streams sort of fell into these, these four areas, and, and all that we're seeking to do this morning is give you a flavour of some of the key things that, uh, that, that, that we have um, implemented and are, uh, and are still implementing, in fact, in the business. Okay? And again, I'd like to just stress, I think, that you know, although I'm a human resources person, these are not all sort of, you know, soft, pink, fluffy, human resource -y type type issues, although that's the kind of person I am, as you can see. Customer market interface was the first one. I'll just stand back here and get my glasses on. I think I'm blocking your view. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, so in the customer market interface arena, the, the, the white bits here are the recommendations, and then the red bits try and tell you, you know, essentially what we did. It doesn't come out again on the, on the black and white version, uh, obviously. 
Um, so we, we, there was a need, um, we felt, and this was the recommendation, to implement account management processes across marine on a consistent basis, um, including this customer executive role, to put some customer focus uh, training in place to reinforce certain things um, that, were, that were an issue from the analysis that we conducted. Um, there was some stuff about making sure that market information was being fed into the product development process, um, and that came down here as well. Um, and our response to this was to do a couple of things. Uh, firstly, quite an extensive training program, working with a firm called Mercury Herbal, um, to develop and then put in place a customer focus training program. The second thing that we did was we took a pilot approach to address this issue up here of the customer executive role and customer relationship management, or CRM, as we call it. Um, we put a pilot in place in that business. Um, that pilot has been very successful. Um, what we're doing now with that pilot is we're looking to extend the processes that have been developed as part of that across the whole of the commercial marine business through what they call their common business process model. Okay, so we'll have a common process for customer relationship management across all of that business. And subsequent to that, we'll look to extend it across the whole of the marine business. So really quite a major impact there. Um, a consistent process-based approach to managing customer relationships across all of marine. Okay, so that's, that's the end game. We're not there yet, probably won't be there until about the end of 2005, maybe the middle of 2006. But we're well on the way. And you know, a big part of this pilot is getting people to buy into the need for these sorts of things. Why shouldn't I continue doing what I have always done? One of the points that Les put up earlier, the customer is mine, was one of those underlying assumptions. That was a widely held belief. People who'd been dealing with customers in the old regime, in the old structure, pre-acquisition, were saying, well, wh why should somebody else now deal with my customer? Why should they? Because I've got this relationship, it works perfectly well. But of course, that didn't work in the new arrangements because we wanted to present one face to the customer, we wanted to stop the internal competition and all these other aspects. So we had to change. So part of this pilot has been about winning hearts and minds. <clears throat> the second piece here was to clarify the product uh, strategy and the product development process and we have implemented a product strategy board structure right the way across marine. Now I'm not intending to, to go through this in detail but it's just, it's just to kind of demonstrate if you like that there is some hard stuff behind this. So we've got a product strategy process that's been developed. The key points here are bringing together the marketing and the customer information together with the technical and engineering. Okay? The way we'd structured the business there was this perceived divide between the two you know, whence the marketing and the customer people never met with, never talked with the technical and the engineering people. So you could either restructure or you could build some lateral processes, as I mentioned earlier. Our approach was to build these lateral processes, which we call a product strategy process, which essentially brings people together from those different parts of the business and from those different functions from time to time in a structured way with inputs to think about what we should be doing in the way of product development. And they come out with certain recommendations. There's then a marine level product strategy board that makes the final recommendations to the marine executive. So you get a prioritized set of recommendations and you can then determine where it's best to spend your money on product development. That's the gist of it, okay? And that, that arose directly from the project. Uh, that's just a little bit more background. You've got this in the pack, so I won't uh, go into it, but it sort of gives you a, a flavour of the content and the format of these, of these uh, arrangements. One of the, se the second uh, broad area that we looked at was this issue of working the matrix. How do we operate in a matrix environment? A lot of our people, particularly those who come in from the acquisition, were not familiar with the, with the big company matrix type of organisation structure. So... Um, the two recommendations, or the principal recommendations, were to actually define the desirable characteristics and ways of working in a matrix, and then actually tell people what they are. Okay? Uh, nobody had ever told these people, really, how they should be operating. So what, you know, what, is, what is the behavior that I should be adopting? Why have the rules of the game changed, and how have they changed? So that was the, the thinking behind it, which, which seems kind of obvious, I suppose, with, with hindsight. Um, and our approach to this was to develop an interactive presentation on how the matrix works. It's something that you can stand up in front of people and, and discuss, and I'll, I'll show you a, 
picture of that in a moment, which was initially piloted in two businesses and was then released generally in March 2004 and is currently being used in one other business as we speak. Um, we're also now, <coughs> excuse me, I don't think that you know this, Eve, but we, we, well, we don't know it because we only decided it last week, but uh, we're thinking that we want to extend this work through, through particularly through video um, media uh, to develop, I suppose, a more interesting and more interactive and more engaging approach. So we'll have a combination of PowerPoint, a video, and some well-structured training material to enable us to deliver this little package to people. How do we operate in a matrix environment? About changing behaviours, really. Um, this is a picture, uh, one, one picture of the, um, of the interactive PowerPoint <coughs> slide. Now, this, this happens to look nothing like the organisation chart, which is actually quite an interesting observation, I think. So if you put up the organisation chart, it tells you nothing about the way that the organisation works, of course. Um, well, not much. Whereas what this seeks to do, and it builds up, of course, it starts with, well, we have a customer, then you press the button, and, and this one comes up, and, it's, and, you, and you, know, you say to the, to the little group that you're addressing, um, well, sometimes the customer wants a product, and they get that from a customer-facing business unit. And we've got two of those, one's called commercial and one's called naval. And they get the product from these OBUs, and we'll call them OBU2s because we've got two different types of OBUs. And so it goes on, and you talk about what these do, and you talk about how the systems OBUs, the OBU1s, um, develop systems and how it all interacts. And we also define a system and so on and so forth. And then there's other definitions that come in, like what is system engineering and what is application engineering. So trying to get some consistent language, consistent understanding. And the sort of things that come out of this are, you know, why is it important that the people in this OBU2 don't go directly to the customer, which is what they used to do. You know, they'd fly off to Korea, you know, go out to dinner, try to sell their product with the, uh, with the customer directly, but now they're being asked to work through the CFBU here. Why is it important? You have a debate with the people about why that's important, and that's proven to be very effective because it's obvious why it's important when you seek to explore it with people. They still have a role to play in that process, is the other thing that you seek to, to get across to them. And this is about... Uh, this is about I suppose about 10 of these sorts of pages that you build up through to illustrate different aspects of how the organisation is supposed to work. Um, leadership and management and uh, process, uh, quite a big area, this. Um, nice big one here, develop business leaders and managers in marine. Uh, Rolls-Royce has some very well established and very, uh, very effective um, general management training schemes. Um, and our people go on those. They go off on these Rolls-Royce schemes, they come back into our business and they get on with their day job. Um, what we wanted to do here was bring together managers from within Marine and build a community of managers within Marine in that way, rather than they just go off on a Rolls-Royce programme. They've still got on the general Rolls-Royce ones, but we also wanted to develop this uh, community of managers concept within Marine. And uh, so we, we developed a Marine leadership programme, which is three... Uh, three modular program. We ran a pilot in 2003. We've got two more underway in 2004. And at the end of this year, we're planning to bring together the people who've been on each of these three programs for a sort of plenary session when we'll do some you know, mass brainwashing or something um, to try and get them all up to the same sort of level of understanding about how we should be operating, all this stuff about the matrix, what are the right behaviours. And the reason for doing this is that we discovered as part of the analysis with the project that, that there was what was described as a clay layer below the senior group through which it was impossible to get effective communication and the messages were becoming either diffused or they weren't even getting through. So we thought, well, we'll work on that clay layer and we're calling it a community of managers here. So that's the concept that we're looking to, to develop. Um, and Kate's involved in that using the LOM, Landscape of the Mind, tool um, that we first explored in this project. And, uh, Kate's a regular presenter on that programme, more of which later, I'm sure. Um, another recommendation here was to co-create change programmes rather than just impose them on the business and to coordinate the approach to change initiatives across the business. Um, that's implicit there that there were two clear issues that had arisen which, which, which that's seeking to address. Um, and we have addressed that. We now have um, four business priorities uh, established, and they were established at the start of 2004. 
in quality, customer responsiveness, efficiency and growth. Uh, th these were co-created with quite a large group of people from across the business. We've got mixed teams from all parts of Marine working in these areas, each of these areas sponsored by a senior executive, um, and that's proving to be quite effective. And the aim of this is to make sure that we understand the change initiatives and the process improvement activities that are going on within the business, that we understand what they are, that we check that they're the right things, that we check if anything is missing, and we make sure that we've got rigorous project and program management in place to really deliver the benefits on these programs. Okay, so that's the aim of that. And then the final area, you'll be relieved to hear. There might be one more slide actually, but uh, I don't quite remember. Um, was in this area of strategy, structure and synergy, where the recommendations are shown in white again. Uh, we needed to be clearer in communicating our structure, the roles and the interfaces. And we've done various things there. First of all, we published all of our marine organisation charts on the intranet, and we did it in quite a nice way, where you could click on certain parts of the organisation, and it would then go to that person and show who reports in there, and you could do the same. So you can sort of interrogate it and go down and up different levels, which is quite good. So it's navigable. And we also published uh, quite a number, it's probably getting on for a dozen articles now, um, in our various in-house publications, uh, on the theme of understanding the organisation. So, you know, what does this part of the organisation do, who does it relate to, and so on. And we also gave examples there of various parts of the organisation coming together uh, to demonstrate more effective ways of working. You know, we, we used not to talk to each other and it was a problem, now we talk to each other and it's much better, was the kind of theme that we were trying to get across there. And I mentioned also we want to extend that through the video stories um, engagement tool. Uh, and, and what this will do is kind of bring to life what I just tried to explain to you there, which is we'll, we'll get on the shop floor and we'll go into the offices and we'll interview people who didn't used to talk to people in other parts of the business, but now they do, and they'll tell you why it's a good idea and why it's now better and why it's more effective to work in that way. And we think that could be quite powerful. Um, and the, the next one here is to assemble an IPT. That's an integrated uh, project team, uh, a mixed team from around the business to try and identify further synergistic benefits across the business and to share knowledge. This was a tricky one. This one got off to a very slow start. The senior exec sponsors didn't really get a grip on it. Um, fortunately, one or two people in the procurement area did, and they were able to demonstrate, uh, to make and demonstrate about 11 million pounds of, of direct savings um, in 2003. And uh, so that kind of paid for the project in itself, we like to think. Not that there was much cost involved, of course, because these people are really cheap. <laughs> and um, these are the jokes, these are the jokes. I'm, they're um, value for money, is what I should have said. Value for money. That's fantastic. And then in procurement and engineering, we've developed uh, shared databases across the entire organisation where people can, can actually go in and view what we're doing um, with, with certain suppliers and also share information on engineering and projects that are, that are running. This is the final slide. We also had to clarify the strategic process. That was one of the recommendations. Well, we did that. That was surprisingly difficult to do because we had to get into the corporate arena and try and understand the Rolls-Royce corporate strategic process. And, and, and actually, in, in trying to make this happen, we stimulated quite a lot of thinking in the broader Rolls-Royce arena. But we did get a conclusion to that, and we published that uh, strategic process internally. And then the final one was to, 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 to be better at and to further communicate the strategy. And we've got a whole range of things happening there. We have a little card that has our strategy and our critical success factors and our objectives for, for the year. And we've had that in 2003 and 2004. Uh, we publish things in our publications. We have a president's newsletter. The president goes on road shows at uh, about half a dozen sites each year. He's in the middle of those at the moment. Uh, Marine card I mentioned. We have a scorecard, a balanced scorecard, some of you may be familiar with. We implemented that to deploy the business plan through the business. We have a new corporate video and we continue with our annual conference that I mentioned uh, that we'd held back in 2002 in Macclesfield. Last year we went to Copenhagen, this year we went to Edinburgh. So as you can see, we're creeping up the scale a little bit. Next year, Florida, maybe. We'll see. Um, so I think that's, that's it. Backup slides follow on. Save those. <laughs> okay, that's all I have to say. I'm happy to take some questions um, yeah. together with Les if any of you have questions. Les, do you have to come?
forward. I think Terry has gone very quickly through an awful lot of work um, that, that, that has happened. And I think one of the, um, the, the um, interesting things were very much how um, the project actually changed quite significantly when Terry suggested, why don't we bring in the um, high flyers to work with us? So if you can imagine from having half a researcher on that particular part of the project, we then had 21 people working on it. And that actually had a significant um, uh, consequence because these people now are taking these ideas, this experience, um, the complexity thinking, as well as the tools, right through the entire organization. So, yes. Can you say who you are, please, and where you're from? Uh, just uh, two questions. I mean, I know this process is extremely complicated, what is complex. You've made it look very straightforward. Um, the common thing in my mind which emerges is that what you're doing is making the implicit, making the implicit explicit and sharing knowledge and sharing understanding at different levels so people are communicating better and, mm -hmm. and therefore that's the kind of catalyst for the change. Looks like a question. Um, second question related to that is um, how did you really do it when you sort of said you used these questionnaires and set it to In practical terms, what kind of questions did you uh, ask? How did you operationalize complexity theory and how did you analyze it? Because it, from our, I'm working with Katie Trust at uh, Kingston, oh, it's finding yes. very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, your, your first question, if it was a question, I, I just agree with everything that you said there, really. Uh, I think it is, it is complex, and we try to make it as simple as possible in, in putting it across. And, and it was all about, I suppose, at the end of the day, you know, better communication, building relationships as well, actually. We, we use language like it, it's not, we don't just want people to know each other, we want them to like each other. You know, we want to go beyond that, because we think that if people like each other and have spent perhaps some social time together, um, as well as work time together, then they're more inclined to pick up the phone and talk to them and, and have exchanges with them. So it's, it's, it's a lot about relationship building and building those informal networks. And in that way, a lot of the knowledge sharing, I think, happens without you doing anything clever in the way of technology. You know, you can do a lot of this stuff without waiting for technology to do it for you. Um, in terms of how, how we did it, um, if, if you want any of the specifics on the, on the questioning, um, I'd have to defer to some of my colleagues here. I didn't do any of the interviewing, actually. I've got a, you know, sort of overall knowledge of that, but not the detail. Um, but, but I think a big part of this was that, that, that we needed the help um, from the complexity group to, to help us to analyze this great mass of information. You know, we had yellow stickies all over a wall, you know, bigger than this room. We had, literally, we had yellow stickies everywhere. And we tried to analyze the themes that were coming out of this. So what we needed was a process to kind of understand that and collect it and condense it through a funnel almost. I like to think of a funnel. And we did that with, is Nazreen here? Um, yeah. Nazreen, okay, Nazreen um, is, is probably the best facilitator in the world, I think. Um, she facilitated that process together with um, some of the other people here and uh, enabled us to get in a two-day workshop from you know, a great mass of information to something that was concrete and that was giving us some clear messages from which we were then able to develop some meaningful recommendations. So it was a case of going through a logical process to bring it all down through a funnel, something that you could deal with and manage. There's also all the political <coughs> aspects to this. You know, we knew at the outset that certain certain things were out of scope or wouldn't be wouldn't be palatable to the organisation. We knew at the outset that my boss, for example, the president of the business, would not contemplate a major restructuring, not major restructuring. So we knew that that was out of scope. So it was pointless making that recommendation at the outset, and there were some other things too. Um, and I think the, the, what was really helpful from a political point of view in, in getting the recommendations agreed and making them happen was the fact that we had done some analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I remember very clearly, and Eve probably does, when we stood up at the Marine Executive and my colleagues, and we made the presentation, and once or twice my boss said, um, well actually I'm not sure I agree with that, I think we should do da da da. Two or three times he said it, and I was able to say, well, where's your analysis? Here's mine. 
where's your analysis? Here's mine. And gradually the message got across and everybody kind of chipped in. You know, well, Terry's right, of course, you know, this is what people are saying. We can't ignore it. Let's deal with it. So that was really powerful to get away from that kind of intuitive response that some senior people have through being able to demonstrate that you've done the analysis. Because action without analysis is malpractice, is what some people say in the OD organisation development world. And I agree with that very often. It's a long answer to your question. Shall I perhaps answer a little bit the, the second part? I think what Terry is trying to say there is demonstrating the evidence. Um, and demonstrating that evidence was very, very powerful because, uh, again, what he hasn't said is this is an engineering organization. What will convince them is facts and figures. Um, it's not just soft. Uh, uh, so, therefore, having a um, very, very d deep, um, in depth findings that were not just intuitive, I think, carried the day. But very briefly, to answer your earlier uh, part of your question that needs a very long answer, but I can't give it to you now, but we're happy to explore it again this afternoon, is how do you actually use complexity? How we use complexity is we use the logic of complexity in everything that we do. And the logic of complexity says you cannot design an organization in advance top-down and in, deta in advance in detail. What you do do is you provide an enabling environment, an enabling infrastructure. You guide it, you develop it. And I think what Terry has demonstrated for us today is how they actually build that enabling infrastructure by identifying the key elements that were missing. Um, and really they were missing because you know, I, th I think you, you were going almost um, in, in the wrong direction. Uh, at one point, making that clear, I think clarified that direction for them because they were putting a lot of effort, a lot of emphasis in an assumption um, that culture, uh, different business models because of the different countries and so on, was the primary uh, constraint. We showed that that was not the primary constraint and then we showed what else needed to be looked at. So it, it's using the logic in, in, in just building all the tools and methods. Um, the questions and so on, I can discuss the details with, that, with you later. And now there was a question over there. <coughs> you skipped through that very quickly for obvious reasons. Um, if you take complexity theory, how do you know you haven't built in disasters in the future? Mm. As a version of the theory. <laughs> I mean, for example, you've got a script or um, engineers from your customers. Is that really such a good idea? Well, I, I, I think I, I would have to question what you've just said there. I'm glad that you said that last statement because I'm not sure that I could have answered the first one very well. But I'll, so I'll start with the second one and then come back. Um, we, we haven't actually split the engineers from the customers. Um, we, we've structured in such a way that, that it can give that impression. And I think that was one of, the, one, of the, one of the impressions, one of the perceptions that was there through the structural arrangement that we had. But of course, we don't want to separate our engineers from the customers. We still want them to interact with the customers, but working with the customer-facing people um, in doing that. And, and that, that's exactly the sort of message that, that it's been important to get across to people. Um, how do I know that we're not building in disasters? Or, or I, I don't, I suppose I don't really. Um, I, I, I'll quote the president again, I suppose. That, that there was a point during the... Um, Marine exec presentation when we were trying to sell all this stuff when, when he said very unlike him actually he said you know there are times when you know it's just the right it's the right thing to do you just know it's the right thing to do now this is a guy who normally wants a business case that's this long you know with costs and benefits and all the rest of it but he said there are times when you know it's the right thing to do and and I, th I think that, that you know there is that element around this um, I've got quite a bit of evidence um, both anecdotal and also from questionnaires that we've um, that we've conducted with, with groups of people to demonstrate that people are finding it easier to work as effective teams across marine. So we've seen movements from 20% to 30% to 50% in terms of people giving the right answers um, when asked those sorts of questions about how easy is it to operate as an effective team. So, you know, there is some anecdotal and some sort of you know, more concrete um, uh, evidence of, of improvement here. But, yeah, we could be storing up disasters, I guess. Can I, Not Can I yeah, that? Yes. I mean... I understand the point you're making, but I think one of the things about an organisation is it has to be flexible for the future. And we can't predict what's going to happen in the future, so what we're doing today may turn out to be a disaster in the future. 
But I think if you get the enabling infrastructure right and the relationships right between individuals and the networks built, then and they understand that, well, they've already moved once. So, well, if something comes, you know, in the future that needs them to move again, if they've got the right relationships and such like, exactly. then they can adapt to that, you know, change in the future. It might be that you have that sort of as where you might be your, your push against uh, what well, could be, I'm sure that will help, and, and I think also some of the actions that we've got, you know, moving it down the organisation into this community of managers will help, and I, I, I like Les's answer, I'm going to use my backup slides here, look, um, which, is, which is the important one here, um, yeah, we, we, Eve gave us a little talk at well, various times really on, on complexity as part of the project, and and out of that, we developed something that, that we call the Holy Grail of Organization Design. And, and this is all based on complexity stuff. It's probably taken straight from yes. one of your books or something, I guess. Well, apologies if I've breached copyright here. Um, but, but what you're trying to do here in creating this enabling environment is, is create an organization that copes well in unpredictable environments. So you, you, you know, you're, not, you're not setting things up rigidly. You're giving people the freedom. You're trying to empower them to make the changes. And one of the things, again, that Les put up was there was this sentence, you know, somebody should make it clear for me, was the, was the thing that, that people were saying. Well, our response to that is, oh, we'll do our best to make it as clear as we can, but you've actually got to get up your backside and work out what needs to be done. You know, we can't tell you everything. So work out what needs to be done, get on the phone, communicate, get the people together and make it happen. You know, we've got to be doing that at every level. Um, so it's, it's that, which gives me, I think, confidence that when significant changes happen or you know, unforeseen events occur, we've probably got a better chance of adapting because people have got that kind of mindset, you know, they kind of sort it out and work around the structure to make it work, make it happen. In complexity language, it's called co-evolutionary sustainability, and we can talk about further about that later. Yes. Well, just, I would just like to build on um, what you said there. Um, as you said, with hindsight, some of these things have become rather obvious, but I'm quite interested how you managed to plant this idea in your organisation, because it's quite scary, possibly. I mean, how, how did you present this concept to get the buy-in at the top to, to begin this project in the way that you, you ran it? Did they come to you? Did you go to them? How, how did well, these... this, I think the key, the key to it was that we, we, we had this conference event, and we actually asked the 70s most senior people, what, what are the big issues? Yeah. And they clearly identified as the number one priority the need to clarify roles and responsibilities. So, so you know, from that point, we knew we had to do something. Yeah. We knew we had to do something. So that, that was really you know, galvanizing in itself. And, and we wrote to everybody after the conference and we said, we're going to deal with this. We're going to do it. We didn't quite know what we were going to do or how we were going to do it, of course, but we said we're going to deal with it. Um, and uh, so that, that, that was a key point, I suppose. And, and then it was a case of how do you do it, um, and, and that led us down, get the high flyers involved. There was then this sort of fortuitous, serendipitous event when the LSE came on board as well, and we co-joined the LSE with our high flyers. How did that happen? Um, well, I think we had, I had come up with the idea of using the high flyers because I was scratching around for resource, really. You know, how am I going to do this? I've got no budget to go externally or anything. Um, so we, we thought we'd, we'd use the, what we call the ALD, the Accelerated Leadership uh, development population in Rolls-Royce. So we started to, to, to get some of those people interested and then even colleagues came along with this ICOS project and, and I would think I was just interviewed as part of that process and it seemed to me that the two were actually very close to the same and, we, and so we did just co-join them and ran it as a you know, slightly redefined Eve's project, slightly redefined mine and ran them as one project. I mean, one of the things that triggered that question was that you mentioned uh, at some point that actually the, the senior management were having trouble starting this particular thing and it actually emerged from, from people who were doing it who seemed to see Kim on the Yeah. I can't remember quite which... which it was a synergy piece, yeah. 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 And uh, that struck me as quite an interesting uh, thing that something happened which was, uh, it certainly wasn't being, well, you, the way you presented it was, it wasn't being approached on the top at all. And in fact, the leadership was always coming from yeah, yeah. That, that, I suppose in a sense that's encouraging, but it was also disappointing that the two most senior people who were supposed to make that happen actually didn't make it happen. 
and uh, yeah, that, that was primarily an issue of relationship, personal relationship between the two, I think, and, and a degree of turf war that was going on there. Um, uh, they're still there. They're still there. <laughs> Actually, one isn't, though. No, one isn't. One's gone. Yeah, one's gone. So. <laughs> but it's encouraging that the others got on with it, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, well that, that sounds like a six month project uh, <laughs> in itself really. Um, the, the, the CRM piece is quite interesting, I, I again only gave a flavour of it and, and perhaps made it sound quite straightforward. Now the pilot that we ran in, in one of our business units has been a success, but of course along the way it's been, it's been a difficult and tortuous journey because people don't want necessarily to do it in a particular way. They've done it in a certain way in the past, so that you know you have to drag them kicking and screaming um, in, into, the, into the future. And it's been a combination of internal and external resource that we've used. There I mentioned Mercury Irvel, um, quite well known international you know, training group, um, particularly well known I think in the customer <coughs> arena, who've helped us develop some training packages. But from a process point of view, getting the consistency in the process, that, that's been really quite difficult to do. Um, and again, there's been, a, a, I suppose, a, in a sense, a fortuitous co-joining of events um, in, in that the commercial marine business is looking to implement what I referred to as common business processes. And there's a major project around enter enterprise resource planning, um, getting the processes sorted, doing them consistently across the whole business, then having IT to back that up. Um, and what we've managed to do, we've now got agreement that this CRM piece will fit into that. And therefore, you know, everybody accepts that it's going to be common across the business. So we've managed to, to meld it into that. Um, and it, it, so it strikes me as a sort of slightly opportunistic approach that we've taken, but life's a bit like that. The, the, whole, the whole project was like that, really. It was you know, an, op it's an opportunity here for us in human resources to make an impact. Here's an opportunity to work with the LSE on this. You know, these things sort of crop up, discontinuities, and you leverage them to the maximum effect, I think. But that's how we're going to make the processes stick, is through that common business process. A lot of self-organisation and allowing emergence, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My name is Daphne Stoll, it's from our Institute of Technology, Stockholm. Uh, thank you for your presentation, I like it, I learned a lot. My question or other comment is less related to complexity theory and more to the complexity of your organisation. Mm. Uh, from your summary of slides here, I got the impression that, in fact, you don't work in a matrix, you work in a cube. You have a three-dimensional organisation, you have customer uh, dimension, you have a corporations dimension, and you have a pensioner dimension. Uh, so, you are, to some extent, you try to solve a three-dimensional management problem or a management of cubism or something like that. Uh, and that may partly be related to the problems or the necessity to clear out the responsibilities within the organisation. But I mean, it is a heavy task to solve the three-dimensional management problem when we know that already management, management and matrices, matrices is quite a task. Yeah, and, and you're probably, in making that statement, you're, you're probably still actually simplifying the reality because there, there's geographical um, aspects to this as well. You've, yeah. you've got you know, regional or geographical fiefdoms yeah. that cut across it. You've certainly got site uh, fiefdoms, you know, loyalties to local sites. You've got loyalties to products as well, actually. Yes. 
um, within there. So, so we describe it as the matrix, but you're right, it's not a straightforward two-dimensional. It's probably three, four, five, I don't know. You know but it is, it is quite complex. And the, the other thing that we've, we've got is we call these things customer-facing business units, but you go one level beneath the surface and you've actually got operational business units reporting in to those customer-facing business units. So not only have we got quite a complex matrix, it's not even a pure matrix, it's a hybrid. Um, in, 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 you know, we haven't even got all the OBUs in one place or in one, in one part of the matrix. So, and, that, and that, again, is another degree of complexity. Now, I, I think that there is considerable scope still to make some organizational changes, some hardline structural changes that would, that would make the organization structure you know, more optimal, I suppose. Um, and would and would help and would help and we're, we're it's interesting now that we've been through this process we're, we're kind of revisiting the need to perhaps do a little bit of reorganization structural reorganization to make the next step change in improvement adding on to that if, if you don't mind me uh, uh, coming in there but of course as organizations go globally then there are a whole stack of other influences on the organization uh, which influence the structure and, and the organisation charts. You know, things like taxation, rules, um, you know, legal issues in different countries, um, that can be regional influences. So there are lots of drivers as, which send you down a particular route. Um, but if you get the informal networks and the, the relationships right, then you can actually cut away, you know, cut through some of the hard impositions on the organisation. One way of structuring it is to say that some dimensions are more important than others to eliminate the set of dimensions. Yes. Yeah. 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 The concept of primacy, if you like, within you know, which, which, which takes precedent in the event of a dispute. Yeah. Um, we, we've talked about that. It's really difficult to do in practice. Really difficult to be to generalise on it because invariably you get into discussions about well, it depends what you're talking about. It depends on the circumstances. Um, really, really quite difficult to do. I think we've got two more. The gentleman at the back, and did you also have? Yes. Well, I can't answer this question. In a project like this, obviously there's pressure for early wins. Um, what was the pressure like, and um, were there any events or deliverables that constituted early wins? Um, what time, what time frame did the early wins start emerging? Made people feel this is going in the right direction. Yeah, interesting. Early wins. Um, I, I don't think that there was sort of massive pressure to move enormously fast on this. Um, in retrospect, I don't know whether you I, felt that. I, don't I, think I think there was a there was a dilemma that, um, that that we faced as a project team. One was obviously to go through the rigor of the research, and I, I made a, a slight comment earlier on that you know Eve, Eve wanted us to spend a lot of time you know, sort of six months, beyond six months, but recognising internally that, you know, we had to do something within a reasonable time frame. Um, but in terms of the early wins, what we tried to do was uh, to refrain from jumping in at the deep end and say, oh, well, we don't have to sort all this lot out. Um, and so it was important that we went through the interview process and collected our data yes. without actually trying to make any assumptions of, of where any early wins were. And it wasn't until we actually went through the analysis uh, and came up with the underlying assumptions that we would then start to focus on, you know, what were the, the likely um, things that could be implemented. So quite disciplined in that sense. Yeah. I think. You know, we, we, we didn't feel under any great pressure to move quickly to do things. The key things that, that, that we had done that had an immediate impact was, first of all, we'd asked all the senior people what they thought. Mm. And I think we'd convinced them that we were actually going to try and do something about it. And, and that was really important. So I think we won some trust there. And then, of course, we went through the process and we have delivered some stuff. Also, I think it was actually involving a lot of the people from um, Scandinavia, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so that someone actually sat and spent quite a lot of time with them listening to what they had to say. Um, in the, there was quite a lot of tension there. And the fact that um, Rolls-Royce were actually doing this um, I think helped. That was perhaps one of the first steps to break down that lack of trust and to say, look, I'm, we know we are, you are unhappy, we're actually doing something about it, we're listening to you, and this is going to go straight to the board. 
Um, so I think that was very much part of it. So I'm hearing the listening at the start really gave you a bit of space. Yeah. 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 Listening, talking, getting things on the table, the cultural stuff that we did up, up in Macclesfield was was really quite a turning point. Um, you know, the, the Brits, of course, we think we're the best, don't we? But so do the Norwegians, so do the Swedes, so do the French, you know, so do the Americans. Um, we, we've all of us got our funny ways. We spent a lot of time talking about those funny ways and laughing together about them, you know, as much about the Brits as we did about the Norwegians and the Swedes, because the Swedes are hilarious. Um, and the Finns. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I but think our last, our last question. Okay. Yeah, my name's Helen McCrory, I work as a strategic facilitator, but obviously only the second best in the world. Um, I was curious about your, the, the beliefs and the underlying assumptions that you identified, I'm very interested in, in how you move to change those. And, and I guess my question is around, I mean, you talked a lot about business processes and HR and training processes. For me, some of those beliefs seem to be inherent in the financial structure of an organisation, mm -hmm. like, you know, the customer's mine and I have to look after my own yep. interests as a business in order to move forward. Yep. So I guess I'm curious about how the kind of financial structuring and the way which people, were, you know, businesses were, were targeted and all of those kind of issues dovetailed with what you were doing. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. That's a great question. And, and that it remains an issue for us because what we have got is an immensely complex financial reporting system. We've got poor IT, fragmented systems. We cut and slice the finances all sorts of different ways. And of course, what, what that does in itself is it creates little, um, what's the word, enclaves, you know, and it creates division and barriers because people become obsessed with their own little piece of it. One thing that we have done is we've made sure that the reward systems are marine-wide based. So, you know, this isn't just about structure. It's not just about lateral processes and behaviours. Um, it's about making sure things like your reward system matches up. Now, that wasn't something that came out of this project. It's something that we did sort of independently. Um, I think it was already in place, actually, at the time. Um, but that's important. So, so there's no benefit in me doing something that's going to help my little P&L account here if it's to the detriment of the rest of the business. No benefit in that. No benefit to me in competing with another part of the business to look after my own piece. So the, the reward structure we've, we've, we've reinforced... We still have, though, uh, too many P&Ls. Um, first of all, it's time-consuming, it's burdensome, and it still tends to, even though everybody's on a marine-wide bonus arrangement, and I mean everybody in the business is on a marine-wide bonus arrangement, from top to bottom, um, even though they're on that, still you get the issues because people are concerned about their local P&L, because in a sense they're going to be assessed on that in terms of how they've performed. So we, we, you know, we need to move away from that, and we've got some work on that at the moment where we're reviewing it. But it's difficult because of the, the complex requirements of, of Rolls-Royce, the corporation, for financial reporting and so on, legal entity reporting and so forth. But we can, we can certainly move from where we are to an improved state. Thank you, right. thank you very much. And thank you, Terry and Les. I think uh, you even surprised me. <laughs>